Hello, I'm Christina. I am an associate lecturer at ULCCW for Immersive Technologies uh, and I, today we're going to be looking at Frame VR, which uh, Chris already explained is one of the parts of the ecosystem we'll be looking at. Do you all have laptops with you? Because we're going to be really practical. So we're going to um, be making accounts and the, the aim is that we're all going to be actually physically here and virtually also present together with the people online. We are going to be converging into a, a frame. So I'll talk you through the process of setting up an account, how to navigate it, how to what you can do. There's obviously, as, as mentioned, there's a lot of stuff you can do with it that is not really well we necessary for us or not relevant. And there might be things that are relevant for you that we haven't thought of. So, um, but before we start, I'm just going to give a brief introduction into what it actually is. So, my glasses. So, uh, WebXR is, is an API, so an application um, programming interface that brings augmented reality and virtual reality to the web. So, think about it's almost like a 3D website. So, instead of 2D content, you have 3D content. Um, and then it's yeah, it's built on a. I mean, frame is built on a frame, um, complete you know HTML uh, and a web framework uh, for building uh, virtual experiences. It is in still in beta version, so it's not 100% stable. But we've been using this for like two and a half years now, I think, and we've actually been quite instrumental in developing some of it as part of a user kind of experience, because we're in communication with the people who are actually developing it. Um, it's part of the Bella, who is a big company who run these hideous online conferences. And yeah, I mean, it's not my thing, but this tool is really, really useful. So uh, we've built various um, frames during the pandemic, for example. We're also part of the, uh, Chris is leading the Digital Mega Collective, which is a um, collective of like-minded um, students, staff and alumni from UAL. And because we couldn't meet in person here, normally we meet in person, we just started meeting online and Frame was a good way to do that. So for one and a half, two years, we met every week twice and um, did kind of various experiments and speculative works with students across UAL really. It wasn't just CCW, it was LCF, it was CSM, Wimbledon, I mean, it was like everybody was coming and it was quite a quite a cool experience. We, uh, so this is the, the space that we met and I can actually show you. You can all go there if you would like. So it's uh, www.framevr.io forward slash DMCXR. This is just to show you one room before we set up our own accounts. So this is a crew, one of the environments that's actually out of the box from frame. And as you can see, none of, I assume most of you don't have an account, but so you actually don't need an account to be a spectator. You can talk, you can uh, interact in that way. You cannot build your own frame without an account, but you can visit um, any frame you want. So we, you, there is a screen sharing possibility that you can import various images, you can import 3D models, you can build your own environment, you can import videos. There's obviously a, a limit on how much you can import and it all depends how stable your internet is as well. Um, you need a fairly good 
bandwidth. It needs to be ideally on a Chrome browser. And um, yeah, so as I said, we, we've held like twice a weekly meeting during the pandemic in here. Um, and it was a very successful um, endeavor. We then uh, went on to um, create little rooms for the students who were part of this. Yeah. So you can go up the stairs and here are, you can put links in to different like portals. So these are different links to different worlds that people have created. We then held another um, meeting with external experts on digital fashion in December 20, where we invited people to, to come and um, yeah, talk about their experiences and talk about um, digital fashion, which was at the time um, very fairly new. Um, we had some really interesting people in there. So we built a 3D environment for that and did a speculative meeting, um, which hopefully works. So as you can see, I've just built an ad portal and you just go there. Well, and... might need to block people of registration. <laughs> so the basics of moving in 3D. Ah. Basics of moving in 3D, you go W is forward. A is to the left, S is backward, D is to the right, or you use the arrow keys. Sorry, Matt, I'm using your computer. Also, uh, a lot of the WebXR stuff also works okay on iPads. Yeah, it's, and, um, it does. Also on phones. It's not brilliant on phones, but it works on phones. Obviously, your movement on a, on a phone it's a bit different than an iPad. So with phones and iPads, you normally have like a little kind of joystick thing that you can move your finger around. Ooh. It goes a bit crazy for some reason. Another thing to bear in mind is not to have too many tabs open. I don't know if that's still the case, but if you've got too many tabs open, the system crashes. Well, I'm just going to show you this this one space, and then we just go back to the beginning so and start is, setting up. Are we all going with you, or we're just watching you? Um, well, if you want to come with me. So the challenge now for everyone is to go up these stairs <laughs> yeah. using your WASD key. Prize for the first one. There's so a cookie for the stairs. first. One. It's always really funny watching people watch that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me. There's somebody. There you go. We're all drunk. <laughs> come on, let us stairs. There we go. There we go. Obviously, you're all, both of you are guests because you're not locked in. Uh, you can change your name, but if you're not locked in, the name will disappear next time you log in. So, and I'll show you all that in a minute. This was just to get you an idea of the space. So, once you're all up there, you click on this head and it will give you this this pop up, which is basically a link to the other space. I'm going to show that again. Just, uh, yeah. So basically you click on the poster and this will appear and just say go there. You cannot be in two frames at once. So Mike, on and off is either the M or the little microphone at the bottom here. It's the cage, it? It's standing there. I checked my email. <laughs> <laughs> She's pretending to be here. <laughs> so everybody so made it up the stairs, I think. Stairs. And then once you go up the stairs, this thing with the head, this, uh, if you this, click on it, you'll get this. This pop up. So, so go there and it'll take you. So these are like portals into other WebEx space. 
And this is an example of a, a space that we, as Christian was saying, that we did and saw. So is that one there? Looks like it. Yeah. This is cool. Yeah. So you just take on that, pick on that head. That you, yeah, it, it, you can't walk into it, unfortunately. So. Through Metaverse. There we go. So this is uh, a different example where it is not an out of the box environment. It's an empty environment, which we just imported some 360 images into um, because we weren't sure. Again, it, this is quite a while ago and it was a lot more unstable at the time. So we didn't because we had some quite international, quite high profile people in there. We really didn't want it to crash whilst we're doing the talk. So the only thing we imported was a 360 and uh, these little cubes to kind of orientate yourself um, within the space. We then um, had seven provocations that we went through and we built it in a way that um, you were asking the question and you were walking through um, the different scenes. Sorry. There you go. So we're in scene two now. Um, this was, I can't remember. So who are the fashion cyborgs? Uh, what's the carbon footprint of these shoes? So we basically had a yeah, round table conversation with these experts around these different provocations. And as I said, this is just a different way of using this frame. Normally it's used for like schools or presentations or um, just social meetups, but you can use it also in a different way. So um, because the 360 sphere is obviously stationary and you can't get close to it. So whenever you move, the sphere moves with you. So it's like the horizon. The horizon will never, you will never reach the horizon. That's why we put these little cubes in there just to give you an orientation in it. As you can see, when you move within the space, the sphere doesn't change. And that is quite difficult for most people who enter this space for the first time to get their head around. It's still difficult for me <laughs> sometimes to just get your head around that you will never reach the horizon. So in terms of perspective, in terms of scale, it's really hard to um, to comprehend that in the beginning. Um, we did some workshops recently with illustrators where that became quite clear, where uh, items were either too big or too small, or it was just, it's a lot of trial and error, basically, when you draw um, the background yourself. Um, yeah, this, as I said, this was just to show you that it can be either like a physical represented space or it can be something abstract like this. Um, it depends what you want to use it for. We have also done a lot of um, LiDAR scans, which we imported as an environment. Um, again, it becomes quite abstract if you walk around a LiDAR scan. Um, or you would take one of the, or you build a building and put it in there, or you uh, take one of the environments that frame offers. Um, it depends what your user case is and how much knowledge you have in 3D building as well. So let's go back. This was, as I said, this is just to give you an overview of um, what frame can do. So I will now talk you through how to set up an account. And as I said, if you've been in there before, bear with us. But we would really like to for everyone to be able to create an account and be in there together later on. So um, I guess also what we want to know is we did, like I say, because in a way we, we want to develop um, the best way to sort of introduce this. Thing. So I guess it's good to maybe confirm as we go, you know, in terms of getting a, like a getting a, a sort of example like that. Is that useful? You know, to have, to give an example to people first before you to the students first before you go in. So in terms of the structure of the workshop, yeah. I think Christine's looking for feedback. Yeah. Now, so we can 
we can put that together as a resource. Would you like to know how to get in and create an account, everything before you know what it is, or would you like to, or maybe a more detailed overview of what to do, you know, what you, what it entails? I think definitely seeing a, a, a working example is good. I think the, I think also understanding that, like, like with WASB keys, the moving around things, that just the basics, and yeah, yeah. Seems like, I think a lot of the time when we show this is the first time people are doing 3D web. And also the devices, the different devices, is a thing because WSD keys doesn't work on there. Yeah, so it works on um, laptop. It works on a headset as well. It works on a phone, not brilliantly, but it does. Um, and it works quite well on an iPad. The interface is slightly different on an iPad, and obviously on the on the headset, you use your controllers to move around, um, not the keyboard. We've got a question. Okay. What's the difference with hubs? Then hubs. Maybe let's explain what hubs is. So Mozilla Hubs is is another WebXR platform. So the, there's a few WebXR platforms out there. Um, and Mozilla Hubs is built or was initially built by Mozilla, the browser, you know, the people that made the browser. Um, and it's again built on Brain. Uh, which is the technology that underlines the, the, the platform that we're building ourselves and playing VR. Hubs is open source as well. I think that's the difference. So yeah. for me, the biggest difference is Hubs is an open source project, which means it was developed by the community and is kind of out there as, a, as an open source piece of content that can be adapted and, and built on. Now, where Frame VR is proprietary, which means it's kind of its own by a company, and the and the the platform isn't out there for people to adapt to adapt to to build on and to they can contribute to it uh, and contribute to its development, but it's it's very much owned by a company, and that company's got a, a monetary sort of uh, incentive, incentive coming yeah, later on yeah. to basically you know. It's free to a point, and then you start paying for stuff. So in May, that's that's the biggest difference between the two. Now, when we first started looking at WebXR with the students over lockdown, we both went. We went. We didn't choose one or the other. We went and did something in hubs, and we did some stuff in Frame VR, and then the collective decided that they they preferred Frame VR as an environment. It was just that it had less glitches less you know it was, it was just more comfortable and experience so i think the threshold was that, slower as well i think slower uh, uh, where frame vr was very in terms of well that because it was owned by a company you could say all oh, the sounds really bad in this can you sort it out and they'll put it on their, their list to fix and in two weeks later they'd say we'll fix this problem Fix this so they were very responsive in that sense. Yeah, they've got still a very responsive Discord channel. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah. yeah so, so I guess the point is, is that you know we're just showing frame VR because uh, it's something that we found that the students have liked and it's, it's, it kind of works quite well. We've been counting more problems with hubs, um, but hubs is definitely if, if hubs is of interest, it's definitely something to yeah. explore. Yeah. Um, don't don't not. I think there are slightly more possibilities in hubs potentially because you've got a different um, way of, in, you know, importing stuff. But I, I just think for out of the box uh, frame is a lot easier, I find. But, you know, if somebody else, you know, um, thinks differently, then it'd be great to if they could share that. Well, Josh, has got any perspective on that? Hubs? Um, no, no, nothing more than you said, really. I think, um, yeah, I think it's like, it comes down to kind of the proprietary nature of it and who's built with it, and then they're, they're kind of like, they've left their mark on it. Sort of, you know. yeah. But yeah, essentially, they're very, very similar tools, but also similar technologies. So. And, and that also, as I understood it, um, Hubs was built, was built on a framework, um, and, and that framework, which was um, or is, um, a frame um, has has had various situations and adaptions to it. So I've I've heard and I, I kind of understand from the experience 
that that framework, that infrastructure is built on, is getting a bit messy. And I think, and that's what's potentially causing some of the problems with it. Uh, so, so I think, um, I think it's one of those things is, yeah, just drop down on Mozilla hubs, have a look at Intel, and you decide yourself basically whether that is the space for you. Um, I think that's the point with the ecosystem. The ecosystem is, is for us to explore. But at the moment, we're just focusing on certain parts of the ecosystem, um, acknowledging that there is more as a massive ecosystem. There's, and there's also popping up new things every week. So, um, so, but we found a workflow that that is, you know, useful for us with Frame, with Gravity Sketch, and that's why we stuck to it, I guess. Um, any other questions? So um, these are, as I said, four, four examples um, that we've built. Um, this one is um, like a digital twin-ish of uh, the Tate Exchange, um, which is the fifth floor of the Tate Modern, um, where the Digital Maker Collective had annual residencies, weekly residencies with um the whole collective and just exploring and um, testing out stuff speculative um, responding to a provocation that each year was different um so we thought like again pandemic it couldn't happen well it happened just before lockdown actually but then obviously it couldn't happen so we thought oh well maybe we can just build it so we did a digital replica of the of the tate uh, which is a bit of a challenge because obviously there is limits on how big a model. Um, I don't know how familiar you all are with 3D modeling, but the polygon count has to be quite low and the models have to be under 10 megabytes. So to build a big building under 10 megabytes, you need to kind of optimize it and it's it's not that easy. So um, basically what we did is because I didn't know how to optimize it properly. <laughs> I just built it in different parts and then imported them all individually and then put them back together. So that was my workaround. Uh, not ideal. Um, but again, this is quite a while ago. Um, then we did a um, digital hackathon um, in Bavaria where we used a... Um, so I was sitting here and the hackathon was actually happening in, in Bavaria, again, in the pandemic, during the pandemic. And uh, we used one of the um, out of the box environments um, of Frame and ran quite a successful hackathon um, in Frame. So let's create an account. So you all go to um, framevr.io. Can I ask a quick question? Yes. Yes. Which do students show a preference for the kind of um, replicated spaces, like like being in a replicated <coughs> familiar space, or being in a you know kind of completely fictitious space? Have you found? I think it depends on the uh, discipline. Yeah. If it's fine art, then obviously it's a bit more. <laughs> interpretation of you know more conceptual mm -hmm. if it's uh, so I'm coming from a spatial design uh, background so obviously you know I like building spaces however personally I think there is no point in replicating the real world why you know it's never going to be as good as the real world so for me is to push the boundaries and actually build something that you cannot have in the real world that still there needs to be some sort of relevance to the viewer because otherwise they just get lost. I've been in experiences where I just didn't know what was up or down and I didn't know how to, well, you know how to move, but you move and you go on some roller coaster and you don't know what's happening. So I think there needs to be, it depends also on the experience of people. So I think there is an argument for both, um, but it depends, you know. I mean, we've done exhibitions where we replicated a gallery space and put stuff on the wall. Yeah, and that was, you know, fit for purpose for that purpose. But is it really what you want to do when you can do anything? You know, it, it depends. 
it's more conceptual question for me. And can, sorry, before we go. No, 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 it's good. Um, can participants be building space? Yeah. When they're in space as well? Uh, so, or does that have to be done prior to? Like, I'm wondering about, you know, all students are in space building the space that they want to be in. Is that? I think that. Adds to the space, right? Um, so, so, in terms of uh, putting environments in and whole buildings, then ideally you want them. You need to do that externally. But, yeah. but, you, but students could be putting objects in and, and uh, artifacts. And, yeah. And, yeah, which they have already built somewhere else. Yeah. But um, that's why we think um, gravity sketch and frame works quite well together. Obviously, it's quite abstract, um, but. Um, you know, you make something and you can put it quite easily, and we've done quite a good workflow for that. So, just on the point of environment, so I think so. This that environment in the top in the left hand corner but was basically our home over lockdown for the Digital mm -hmm. Maker Collective, and where we met twice a week for like a year and a half. And it became, it became a bit of a sanctuary, really. It was, it was, um, it, I think what was uh, important about that was it was. It was um, it was a real it was a sort of replication of a real sort of room because basically we, we were getting new people coming in often that were totally new to this and you know never done it before ever um, and I think to be in a, a place that is not too crazy and not you know because I think it, 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 there's already a sort of level of, of getting used to operating in that way. To have, you know, just have no floor or to have a, a, no, no sense of orientation, it just adds to the confusion. So we found that room was actually a good stable place for onboarding people in, and, and that's why we put portals off to places. So we, uh, at the start of every meeting, it always started the first 15 minutes in that space. So any new people came in, they could just orientate themselves, mm -hmm. and then they could say, okay, now we're going to jump to the floor, it's all going to be crazy. So the new ones are back. Uh, yeah, so that's really important. It's really important to have a consistency in one element because people, even if it's easy, easy like frame, people do get lost. Mm -hmm. And we found that a lot of people are um, afraid mm -hmm. and you need to kind of help them over the threshold. The ones that are over the threshold is actually fine. So creating something that is relatable is quite, is quite important. Um, and once they're kind of in the zone, then you can send them off and do crazy stuff. Yeah. Thank Same with uh, the exquisite corpse. <laughs> I mean, the iterations we've done with that, <laughs> it's quite, uh, yeah. We've got a question. Oh. So, I, 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 so in terms of the case study, I, I think, to, so the case study in terms of working with the collective in the WebXR, I would say, you know, it's not really, it's more of an informal case study, for example, of working informally with students and alumni in this space. Um, we, we don't really have any, I, I guess the only time I've, I, I've seen WebXR used within the curriculum was basically when, when we were doing this, um, some of the fine art courses at Chelsea saw what we were doing um, and we're interested in, and then this is during the pandemic and then basically said that we want to do a, a, a show using frame vr so they actually got 150 students to set up a series of rooms and did a big exhibition based on like 22 rooms where all the students can uh, occupy each room and did an exhibition that was a really good example, I guess, and that was curriculum that was assessed and everything. So that was the, that was the first time I've seen frame VR integrated. There's, there's a distinction there, isn't it, between a product or an output like that, like an exhibition space, and an actual sort of working, functioning um, space, which serves some sort of teaching utility. Yeah. yeah. I think it's really important. Exactly. Mm -hmm. It's pretty central on this sort of yeah. uh, project. No, exactly. so, is it, unless we start testing some, even some of these um, existing spaces to soon to see how the learning happens, we're going to be in a, exactly. so we're not necessarily going to have the material we need to proceed effectively. But I mean, in a way, we did some when we did the, the project with the AOI, mm. although it wasn't inside this space. What, it, what was interesting was the kind of combination, I think, of using 
being together inside of a massive space and also not the, the dimension previously being a physical space as well and then what the impact of those those sort of simultaneous interactions is yeah um in a way i mean we were kind of catering on kind of looking at what's happening in the physical space it's probably more so that this acted as a kind of mediator rather than a than a we weren't sort of observing necessarily what was happening with people as they were interacting um inside of that virtual and massive space and that's probably the next stage i mean some of it's been kind of carried out in a light way with the the rest of the the project i would have thought and looking at the workflow yeah I, I i think it will be the next stage i think yeah. the onboarding has been such a big yeah. issue initially for us you've been a bit consumed by that i mean i think the the, the session you did with the eye was, was yeah. 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 <laughs> That's one word for it. <laughs> oh, are you recording this, by the way? Yeah, yeah. yeah. okay. Because I think there was 18 students in yeah. the in one space, and that, that was quite a lot to handle at the yeah. end. But um, I, I think the next for, for the case study model you sort of put forward is, is really sort of thinking about how we can use those spaces more to deliver content. Yeah. So in, in terms of that, in terms of um, delivering the teaching in these spaces, so um, obviously we did it with the DMC informally, but, and that involved 10 to 15 students alumni two days a week in the space, new people coming in there. And then from that, we were then invited to come in, um, and do sort of sessions with courses. So we did quite a big session, I can't remember what course it was. Graphic design. Had, well, there was a couple of sessions. We did it with Dave Barnett's design course, and then we did it with um, uh, a performance course as well, where they had like 150 students uh, or 100 odd students joining us. And I think that this is where we need, you need to get those strategies about how you can use this technology and understand its limitations. Hmm. So, so we had like, um, I don't know, 10, 15 people in the space. Um, having a conversation or having, you know, doing a presentations and stuff like that. And then we had another 150 students joining from a, watching it on Teams, like we're doing here, joining them from a, from a sort of outside perspective, the kind of spectatorship, spectator kind of role. And in a way, I think that's quite important because that's that kind of, I think that's kind of part of this vibrant experience that, you know, you will have people fully immersed um, and then you have people observed and, and I think a lot, a lot of us so are working with Edify at the moment which is a tool that is specifically developed to enable that so the idea of Edify is that the academic or tutor or whoever's delivering them is, is in a VR headset and they're utilizing the full power of VR to deliver their lesson with 150 students watching uh, easily from a shared screen just watching the, yeah, the, the digital telephone lesson we are basically not in not that we are but whatever it is so 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 i think coming up with those strategies for how you how you integrate this is going to be something that we can explore there's also obviously with the free version you have 15 participants at one time so if you want a higher number you probably have, either have to pay or talk to them like we did <laughs> But um, so, yeah, you can have up to 150 people now, I think. Don't know how that's working out, but um, you would have to. Um, that's obviously monetized. So, yeah, but I, I would never I would, I would, I would never jump into <laughs> obviously 150. I wouldn't. Yeah, that'd be I, chaos. I, 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 I think the person the best way to approach this is to do what I did with Daryl and Matt with the illustration is to just do a little research and development. Thing with the few students and a few staff and and yeah really sort of understand the technology and understand its limitations then start to scale it i think i would never jump straight in um because that's yeah that's serious serious chaos professionally i i think one of the questions of this platform is what constitutes a conversation because it's very much if you look at the difference between this and gravity sketch gravity sketch is you can really see what or determine learning outcomes because people are working together and being proactive. Here you default to uh, a space for presenting mm -hmm. and spectating. Mm -hmm. 
I think what I'd like perhaps the latter stage of our case study to look at is what constitutes a conversation. So it might be how you share material and the fact that you put in audio files or images or pieces of writing in PDFs. And you don't necessarily have to do all PDF, that's one advantage, but actually you can sort of constitute a conversation in different ways. And I think maybe that's where some of the answers lie. Yeah, and also how you maybe um, you know ignite the the conversation or the the um, provocation, you know, set a provocation and kind of because sometimes if everybody is standing there like this, you know, they don't know what to say and they think like, oh, can I talk? Yes, you can, you know, and then everybody's talking over each other. Then it's all a learning process as well about the etiquette, etiquette of in, in it's like coming to a room and you start shouting no. Um, just because you're online, you think you can do that? No. But also, you know, there's people make mistakes. So they yeah. Mics on. They don't know the mic. They, they've got the headphones in, and they're saying, "Put your headphones on." But it is the headphones on. Yeah. Yeah. So I think there's a lot of yeah. There's a lot of little things like that. And yeah, and obviously there can be confusion. Well, uh, I think yeah, that when you've got a lot of people in there. And I think again, this is where. Frame VR was really good because they started to put in like um, audio spaces. So you could like go to certain parts of the room and all the audio from the rest of it. So you could have 100, uh, not 100, but you could have 40 people in space and have like people bubble. in one location without yeah. all the noise of the other. So in a way, I mean, the way it works, I mean, it's sort of, um, it's the web XR version of Collaborate, where we, we collaborate Botra from Blackboard to your team. Yeah. yeah. And you know, people just like you can essentially do all of those things. Yeah. You can put people into breakout rooms and you can bring them back out. Yeah. Is there any capacity do you think with this technology to be the facilitator, to be the person who can manage that situation? If, for instance, you did have a large group of students and you wanted to replicate some of the functionality of Collaborate, which in a way is a, is a sort of is an interpretation of how you might manage the classroom mm. once you get space. How do you how might you then start to think about this space? Um, as a way to enable that kind of live teaching experience. I, I think we tried. I, I, you know, so, so in a way, I'm just going to connect to, this is the accelerator place. Yes. Going, so I'm just going to, basically if you have 40 students in, um, in a space like this, then you see these little blue areas, these are all voice zones. So you could say, okay, so five students go into this room, break out room, five students in this room, five in this room. And break everyone up, but you get you, you get basically all in the same same room, but you won't hear everyone went over here. Everyone. So I, I think rather than send them all off, or you could send them all off to different rooms, uh, different actual different um, spaces together. But I think testing that scenario would be good for us to, to try out in our, especially in our maybe in our case study group, we can try it all going in the accelerator room. And then do breakout rooms in the in the little um, in our case studies. Maybe that's something we can do. But also, if you are in there and you're talking inside the blue area, and you don't know you're in the blue area, nobody will hear you. We've had that as well. So yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But, but but audio is also yeah. I, I think mastering audio is is one of those things. So at the moment, so for instance, for this, we've muted all the audio that's. Uh, in frame VR, and we're using the audio from Teams, which is a strategy we use quite a lot. So I, I think it's about that again, sort of because that works in a, in a hybrid scenario like this, right? So we've got people in the room, people can hear us, people online can hear us, everyone's going through Teams. But I think, you know, I, I, I would say, and I think that should be our goal for Wednesday. Um, afternoon would be to transition away from teams so we're kind of fully in in immersed in one like frame the offices and then we're trying that so we're kind of we, we, we kind of moved away from the you know from the reliance of teams and all the and that's a big thing because especially when we're all in the same room as well how you do that you know because we're all going to have to have headphones in and there's a lot of feedback and all that so all these are problems basically. Audio is a massive problem. Yeah. But going back to the online training we did where Mick 
was showing that demonstration of Blender. Remember, he kind of got that 3D object and then exported it as a GLB model. Um, simple processes like that are, 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 yeah, it takes a bit of time to sink in, but once you once you get those basic principles, um, especially when we're in VR, because we're going to be making stuff in VR, like exporting it, running it through Blender, making it compatible for WebXR, so it's, you know, it's, it's um, like, make sure you know, it's, the textures are baked in and all that sort of stuff. And, uh, and the poly count, which is the size of the actual 3D asset, is not too big. <coughs> Crash the system. Now, all these are things that you, you know we've got to think about. And, we, and I think that's one of the biggest challenges with working with students is that you know, they will throw everything at it and things will crash. And it'll, you know, but I think that's part of the process of just getting their heads around things. And that's what we're going to be going through this afternoon, obviously, to understand that. Bit. And you don't need to know Blender. Uh, like no. you just need to know three three clicks how to convert the model. <laughs> I mean there are online converters as well, but um, I find Blender easier to do. Um, so if you all go on to framevr.io, and the main menu is up in the right hand corner. If you click that, you have a drop down menu. And I know Chris just signed in with his Google, but I never ever did that. So I always go by email, but it's your choice. You can use Google, Microsoft, Facebook, and Immerse login. I don't even know what Immerse is. But um, or just an email and then you need to verify the email and remember because you will have to log in quite a few times so just remember what you're using so yeah here we go email login yeah and that's basically it. So, and then you've got an account. But you do need to, when you do, if you do an email log, you, you need, need, to need to verify it. Yeah, but that's it. Just go back to your email, verify it, and then log in. Uh, also, yeah, you, another good thing is that, yeah, you. You don't need to log in, and so if you are dealing with this with students, they can all still join, yeah, um, without having an account, and they will just be an anonymous robot. Um, they can change the name, but as Christine says, when you refresh it, you need to keep that in, put your name on it, or any sort of change that you made to the avatar. You can interact, so you can talk, but you cannot create your own frame if you don't have an account. Yeah, you can't really, you can't really do that. Do much. You can run around and talk. Yeah. That's about it. But it might be just a, it is just a nice way without getting all this. Well, some people it might not be for them and, yeah. you know, they just want to have a look. And... Yeah. And, and also, there's something that we need to think about as part of this project, which has come up quite a lot, is around sort of data and, mm. and um, you know, asking students to sign up to accounts that are not university accounts. Um, and again, I think that's something that we need to consider as a project about how we deal with okay. yeah, data, basically, and, and that. So it's definitely a, a discussion for Sunday. <laughs> but we're finding it a lot with but the Facebook. So Facebook yeah, um, and the Oculus, you know, the requirement of Facebook login. So at the moment we're just looking at UAL's policies on that, which are you just need to inform the student. Well, they can't be mandatory. You can't say to students that they've got to do it. So it's got to be a voluntary. Um, I can't see the teams. Is there any questions on the teams? Um, on the right hand side, 
you can if you want to. I would just put your name for now. You don't have to put your Twitter. And this is like if you want to connect in the chat, you have a little Twitter thing. If you want to connect Twitter, you can. You don't have to. So yeah, that's the next step. So you put your name into where it says name tag and then click set. Because if you don't do that, then it will um, you can put your company. Yeah, you can put that on. You could put the profile photo if you want. Again, you don't have to. And that's basically you're logged in. You've got an account. So well, that took what? One minute? Um, Any questions? And then we, um, has everybody got an account? Yes. Um, we're going to create a new frame. So you can call it whatever you want. That's going to be the extension if it doesn't exist already. Uh, obviously, Accelerate is gone. <laughs> Accelerate project is gone. Accelerate 2 is gone. So, uh, so you choose whatever. Um, and basically, your URL is going to be framevr.io forward slash and then the name you give the frame. So, but you can create three frames, you can delete them again. And you can also have multiple accounts on 15 emails. So, so in principle, you can have 45 frames if you want, or more. So if you all would like to uh, create a frame, so you go on to create a new frame, you name your frame, No studies. And then you choose, you can change this later on as well. You choose the environment. So as Chris, Chris mentioned, there's different environments um, that you can choose from. Um, so there is a Horizon, Auditorium, Serenity. Well, let's go for the office. And then the last one is an empty one. So if you want to do your own kind of environment, if you're a 3D whiz, you just do an empty one. Uh, so I'm going to choose the, and then you click create. And that's. Um, your friend. How long is this session actually? Uh, we are lunch. Uh, ten minutes. Ten minutes. Okay. Yeah. So I'm gonna speed up a bit then. <laughs> yeah. Everybody with me so far? No. Yes. Yeah. 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 Good. So basically, and then that's your frame. Now you can um, copy the URL and send it to people, and they can join you there. There's lots of settings um, within the frame, um, which uh, you can set notifications, you can set how the skybox or so the thing that's around you is going to appear or not. Um, permissions for people. So if you want, for example, if you have a classroom of people and you want people to be able to add things or maybe some people can add things and some people shouldn't be able to so you can make them a member on admin um you can password protect the frame if it's something secret um you know there's all these different settings and that's in the um settings so all your frames are here your frames so it's frames so again, if this menu is not here, 
you just click on these little three lines up here and it pops up. If you're not logged in, it will tell you. And then um, you just log in again if it locks you out. And then you go on to the frame that um, you want to um, change the settings. Oh, the mouse is a different way. You can also switch to a single user. So if you want this to be a spectator, uh, I, I never really understood why you want to have a single user experience, but there are maybe ways sometimes it's beneficial to be a single user experience. Chris, when would that be? Yeah, so a single user experience, it provides, again, a sense of accessibility. So the uh, example of a single user experience is, I'd say, correct, the gallery. And it takes away all this scope of logging in and stuff like that. You're literally, because it's a single user experience, it basically just makes it a 3D website where you don't see anyone else in there, but you're navigating a 3D space without interacting with all the people. Um, and there's nobody um, else running in, yeah, I'm talking and... It's kind of disappeared, basically. Um, so, yeah, see it as that, think of it as that. So if it's not a single user experience, then you are going to encounter other people, and you, as Kristen said, you control which people, whether it's the general public, or whether it's people you just want to encounter. Um, you, I mean, there's a lot, a lot of stuff that you probably don't need. I, I've never used, but you know, it might be useful for some, some people. For example, the notification when somebody enters your frame, so you get an email. You know, it's obviously online forever, um, and you're not going to be there 24/7. So maybe you're waiting for somebody to enter it, and then you get sent an email. Oh, by the way, so and so just entered your frame. Not sure how useful that is unless you are setting up some sort of meeting. But, you know, again, it might be useful for some people. Um, the user capacity, as I said, in the free version is up to 15. Uh, the spectator capacity is also 15, but you can limit that as well if you want less people. Um, as I said, there's lots of, there's a voice chat, there is a translate thing. I mean, there's lot, might be useful for um, some in this, you know, um, there's lots of stuff that I've never used, but I think it might be useful in this context, actually. Um, the, the chat is up here. So you can type and then you can translate it into various languages. Oh. So you can choose the uh, language. So maybe we use, do we have? Yeah. Unfortunately, there is no Ukrainian. What else do we have? We have Polish. Yeah. <laughs> Are we translate? Uh, is it working? Can't see it. Ah, oh, because I didn't send it. So. Yeah. There you go. Welcome to. Yeah, so it might be useful. Unfortunately, there's no Ukrainian. Maybe we can work on it. Yeah, maybe. Well, that's the thing. We can I can, we can talk to um, Gabe and say we yeah, were hot on the yeah. So yeah, yeah. Impact. Well, he's the, this is the guy that's developing it, and he's very keen on the translating. He's very proud of it, so I'm sure he's, he'd be interested. <laughs> OK, anyway, slightly diverting here. Um, yeah, these are the permissions. As I said, if you want somebody to give permissions to edit, to add stuff, uh, you know, as a default, anybody can add anything. Anybody can enter, anybody can add anything. If you don't want that, you can limit that, which you do in the permissions here. And then you can see who, who you make a member of this or not. So the members then can edit and add. Question? No? <laughs> you were looking for well, it. We have and translate in the chat different sections, not only translate buttons, but and button as well. Um, but it's there, like here. <laughs> just, 
Yeah. But that's the thing, they're adding kind of all kinds of stuff which might be useful for like a specific group that asked, you know, can we have this? I, I, I think the main thing we just wanted to achieve today with this session was just to get you in yeah. to Frame VR. Uh, you know, it, like I say, you know, there's lots of other tools out there. Um, but it's definitely something to just now go and explore in your own time. Yeah. And um, just click things, uh, make things go wrong, try, tr uh, just try different things out. Um, and then obviously start to think about it in, in context of what you're going to be showing this afternoon with me, because obviously it's all going to relate. Because when you make a 3D asset and you export it from Mimic, for instance, then yeah, we can import it into other Webex or platforms as well. And we can, so, yeah, just think of it as, again, part of the ecosystem. Um, you want to show? I think I'm just going to show how to import yeah. something and then, you know, just briefly, because obviously we're running it yeah, all the time here. Yeah. I think that'd be great. Just um, just so, but this is not my PC, so yeah. for yeah. that, so <laughs> I checked. Do you want me to? No, help? I just, um, well, you can. So to, um, to add to your scene, you have to be logged in and it has to be your frame or you have to be an admin or you have to have editing rights. So you click add to this frame here or you click the little plus in the menu down here. Um, should we start with a you know, image? Um, I'm sure there is somewhere. My, I'm, I'm so these are the type of assets you can import. So image, you can make a voice zone. You 3D can... model might be easier. Just okay. Remember. So I'm just going to show you the 3D model, and the little eye shows you the limitation of what format it has to be, how big it can be, that sort of thing. So a 3D model can be either your own 3D model, or it can be from a library called Sketchfab. We're just going to import our own model. So you click. Add 3D model. You also click add to inventory. Down here. And then you click the little paper clip and Matt will find me. A GLB. It has to be a GLB file. Um. Which is basically a um, format that is for Josh can probably explain yeah, that better, yeah. but for the web optimized for the web. Is that right? Yeah, it's like yeah. a it's like a file for 3D model that's got everything in it for yeah. textures and lighting. And then I'll just click add. Yeah, and you click add. And now they have a little thing in here which says optimizing. That's also new. So we have a little pen. Now, obviously, it's positioned where you are looking. So if you want to move it, you have to go into edit mode, which is a little pen. And then you click on the object you want to move, and then you just use the arrows to move it. Or to rotate or scale. And this side window opens. Again, there's lots of other stuff that you can you can do, um, like lock the position, snap to different, um, either to the wall or to floor. Um, you can also scale and rotate from here. 
Now, lock position is quite handy if you are have a lot of 3D objects in the space because it's very, very easy to move something accidentally and it's really hard to move it back into the space where you initially wanted it. Um, because unfortunately, they're working on it, but there is no bird's eye view or top view at the moment. So you have to move in, in perspective and that's quite hard, especially if you wanted you know, very specific space. So you can make objects links as well. So there's an add link. So if you add the link in there, you can link to another frame, like a portal, or link to an external. So, you know, when we went over to the other, like through the portal, that's how we added a link. So here I just added a frame link, but you can also link to an external website or maybe um, a Google, you know, PDF or whatever. You can link to anything really that's on the web. So if you're like a student like showing my work and you can link to their portfolios or whatever. Yeah. Whatever. So and then once you're done, you can click on the little pen again. And you're out of edit mode. Now you cannot move when you're in edit mode. There's also edit mode up here, so there's always more than one way of, of getting where you want to go. Um, yeah. You can't have edit mode in some, so in some, if you're in someone else's frame, and you don't have edited images, yeah. you won't be able to edit it. Yeah. Uh, you won't have that option. Yeah. Uh, but thank you, Christina. I think we'll end there because yeah. lunch is leaving. Yeah. And, um, yeah, it's great. Thank you very much. That's uh,